Good evening, Andrew. Andrew Curtin Vaughan, a member of our society for several years now, and uh, he studied a Master's in Material and Engineering Science at St John's College, Oxford, and a, a Master of Science in Materials and Manufacturing Management at Sheffield Hallam University. He worked for Tata Steel, oh, we can see where that's ended up, <laughs> formerly British Steel and Chorus at that time, for 13 years, including, including five years as technical manager of the Old Oak Steel Plant in Rotherham. He's now technical director of an iron and steel foundry in Chesterfield, Derbyshire. He got his first telescope last February. Now, I don't know which last February that was now. Oh, about last was February 2012 or something like that. Was it 2012? Um, I'll have to alter that then. <laughs> he got his last Fe uh, first telescope in 2012, which was a five inch Newtonian, which he only had for six weeks before upgrading to a 10 inch. And he now uses a 12 inch Dobsonian to visually observe deep sky objects as well as several smaller telescopes for astrophotography. His main interest is space flight and astrophotography, particularly globular, globular, cluster, can't say it, globular clusters. So can you please all welcome in our next Bruins Winton way, tonight's speaker, Andrew curtin -Vaughan. Right. Well, thank you everyone for joining me. <clears throat> Strange actually, because I've probably hosted about a dozen meetings and webinars on Zoom, but I've never actually given a presentation at one of those. I've just been the host, so a bit of a new experience for me tonight. So anyway, thank you very much for coming. I uh, hope you're going to enjoy this uh, presentation tonight. We're going to look at uh, some interesting events to observe over the next three months um, in this, over the summer period, uh, when the nights are unfortunately short, but there are still some interesting things to see. Yeah, uh, briefly going to go through um, a sort of summary. So this is we look at the moon and the planets and what's interesting to observe um, throughout the next couple of months. A little bit on comets and meteors, uh, what's around, what's to see, when to see it, best times, etc. Um, a couple of other interesting events that are coming up in the next couple of months. And finally, as Steve mentioned, we're going to look at clusters. Uh, and the reason for that will be explained a little bit later on. So, uh, obviously, the summer sky is bright and the observing period is, is short. I think realistically, <coughs> excuse me, as we go forward, we're looking at maybe four to five hours of observing time <coughs> every night from maybe around 11 p.m. through to about half past three, four o'clock in the morning at the very, very latest. <coughs> During this period, obviously, if you go a bit further north or south, then those times can be shorter or reduced. Now, during the next three months, really, we've only got the chance to see the two major gas giant planets in the sky, Jupiter and Saturn. And throughout the next three months, they're going to become more and more easily observable as they get higher in the sky earlier at night. But realistically, to observe these objects, the next couple of months, we're going to be looking to be up from around 11 p.m. Probably best viewing is going to be around one o'clock, two o'clock, uh, and then obviously right through till dusk, uh, through till dawn, sorry, when the planets uh, sink. But the, they are relatively low, um, and therefore a clear uh, southern horizon with not too many obstructions is going to be quite critical for good observation of Jupiter and Saturn, as well as also taking consideration of your viewing surroundings. So not looking over buildings, uh, idea or concrete or other uh, areas close by to you that may have stored up heat during the day um, if we ever get any sunny days that is and give off that heat at night and create a bit of atmospheric turbulence in, in front of your viewing so realistically best conditions we're looking for is somewhere with something like a grass area in front of us so we can set up our telescope or our binoculars in a nice clear southern view and get some nice, hopefully some still as possible air 
in front of us, between us and the sky. So we get a nice, clear and, as possible, a still view of these objects. So uh, obviously taking into consideration the moon, and we are going to look at some opportunities to observe the moon uh, later on. But obviously the moon is going to cause a little bit of interference with these objects. However, they are bright and they are uh, nearing opposition. Uh, and I'll cover that a little bit later on. We'll cover a little bit more detail on the best time and what you can observe uh, with these two major planets in the next couple of slides. So the, the minor planets at the moment, which, as we go through into July, the um, the time that we can observe Jupiter and Saturn gets a little bit earlier, and they do also get a little bit higher in the sky. Um, as we go through to August, we do actually get the opportunity towards the, mid, the middle to end of August to actually observe uh, the other two gas giant planets, Uranus and Neptune. Uh, they are emerging as we go around the sun. They are emerging uh, into uh, the night. In the moment they are behind the sun, as far as we are concerned, and we can't observe them, though they are high in the sky uh, during the daytime. But as we get into August, uh, Uranus especially becomes uh, quite observable around midnight to 2 a.m. And it's going to be nice and high in the sky, uh, a maximum 43 degrees elevation. Uh, likewise, Neptune, a little bit further behind it, um, but again, that's going to become good viewing probably around uh, two, three in the morning uh, towards the end of August. So a real opportunity to see the four gas giant planets uh, towards the middle of the end of August. Maybe some good observation uh, period. <clears throat> so what are we going to be able to see with Jupiter? Well, one of the interesting things is Jupiter, as we uh, pass inside Jupiter, is that Jupiter is going to uh, present itself as a retrograde motion in the sky. Um, so which point it's, what we mean by it is it's going to change direction in the sky. The moment every night, the planet is going to be slightly further west. And as we pass in front of it, it's going to appear to travel towards the east in the sky. And then towards the end of October, it's going to start uh, moving in the west every night. And throughout this, during this period of time, as we pass in front of, in front of it, between us and the, between Jupiter and, and the sun, uh, the planet is going to be at opposition, so that's going to be uh, closest to us on the 20th of July. And that's obviously means it'll be its brightest and its largest diameter. Though that doesn't make a huge difference for Jupiter, given it's so far away. So what are we going to see in the sky? This is an opportunity, really, with any telescope or even a camera on a tripod, if you've got a reasonable uh, telephoto lens, is if you can take a, a photograph of the sky in the area where Jupiter is every, every couple of days, obviously assuming you get clear skies, and you were to add those images together, you would make out in the sky that Jupiter is going to observe a make a spiral, a circular shape in the sky. So the current position of Jupiter shown on the screen is actually today, uh, 27th of May, and then around the 14th of uh, uh, June is going to be at its maximum distance west in the sky. It will then proceed to the east until 20, uh, um, the 8th of October, and then it will proceed to the east to, towards the west again. So it gives you a chance to, if you were to take a photograph of the sky over this period, you'd actually have to merge them all together and you would get an image of Jupiter making this uh, reverse uh, movement across the sky. Um, very easy to do. Uh, obviously, you can observe it, but you won't get the uh, true uh, perception of how it's moving. So we can take a photograph every couple of days and then stack them together using the stars as the alignment points. Then you'll be able to create a very nice uh, image of the movement of Jupiter across the sky. In terms of the position of Jupiter, not come up overly well on the screen. So it's going to be highest in the sky across at the southern, in the southern sky um, around 3 a.m. in June. And then by the time we get to the end of August, it's going to be around midnight time. Um, it's going to be highest in the sky. 
It's going to be, not going to be hugely high, uh, about 22 degrees at its maximum, um, but it will be very bright, uh, easily be able to spot it out with the naked eye, focusing on the binoculars. If you've got a pair of reasonable binoculars, uh, hopefully you'll be able to make out the four Galilean moons of Jupiter, Io, Europa, uh, Callisto and Ganymede. And this is uh, what those, this is what those um, position of those moons will be when the planet reaches opposition on the 20th of July. Um, if you want to know more about the, if there's any transits of uh, the moons across the face of Jupiter, there's quite a few websites and apps on, uh, you can download for your phone. I think there's one actually called the Moons of Jupiter app, which will show you the position of all the moons. Uh, if you know where you are and you can put the information about your location into the uh, app using the GPS, for example, then it will predict if there's going to be any transits of the moons across Jupiter. And also, if you've got a large telescope and say a camera, a webcam, or some sort of high speed camera, then it may be possible for you to actually get a very large image and actually pick up the moon or the shadow of the moon generated by the sun passing across the surface of Jupiter. Uh, otherwise, it's just nice to be able to get a pair of binoculars out and observe the largest planet in the solar system and the, the moons. Obviously, Jup the moons of Jupiter do travel. Some of them travel across in orbit quite fast. And from night to night, you can observe the varying position of the moons uh, around the planet Jupiter. But I would highly recommend, I think there's an app called the Moons of Jupiter, um, but it presents the position of the moons and a nice simple chart for the four large moons. And you can see uh, what you ought to see in the sky using that app. Very worthwhile uh, downloading that and have a look at that. <coughs> As we move on to Saturn, uh, unfortunately, if you haven't started uh, photographing Saturn, you've missed the entry of retrograde already. So uh, Jupiter and Saturn are in a similar part of the sky at the moment. So they are uh, in terms of the orbit around the sun, they're in a similar place uh, in, in the, in the uh, solar system. And as such, they um, they will enter retrograde motion relative to the Earth around a similar time. Um, this is a photo of, of Saturn from, uh, uh, I don't know what camera it was from there. Uh, it's one of the NASA images, so uh, obviously a very high quality image. So this is the motion of Saturn across the sky. It is slightly flatter uh, onto us, so it would be very difficult actually to pick up the, the motion in the sky because when Saturn enters retrograde and exits retrograde, it will actually uh, go back behind its previous position. So if you were to take images, you effectively just stack the planet on top of itself, whereas uh, the angle of the Earth to Jupiter means that there's a slight um, change in uh, apparent elevation as the planet travels across the sky relative to us. Uh, as you can see, it, it enters its uh, retrograde motion at a similar time. It's hard to pick up slightly on the right-hand side just after the 1st of September. Um, it enters retrograde on the 11th of October. So moving across the sky all the way through the summer. And it will be uh, still, unfortunately, as a summer object, it's still quite low in the sky. It's only at about 14, 15 degrees. So difficult to observe unless you've got a very, very clear southern horizon in the location you observe from. Uh, so this is the position of Saturn in the sky. This is on the 6th of August, and it's in the constellation Copernicus, uh, right in the centre of the right-hand side of the constellation there. Uh, and you can see Jupiter to the left, uh, similar time, just into the constellation of Aquarius. So some quite good, uh, this is a screenshot from Stellarium, but again, you can use any uh, app if you need to find it. I think Jupiter will be so bright, uh, in the sky, much brighter than uh, most of the stars surrounding it, that you won't need any kind of guidance in order to find the position of Jupiter in the sky. Saturn, though, tends to go a bit fainter. Uh, at this time, it's magnitude 0.2, so it's still going to be brighter than most of the stars around it by one or two magnitude. So, should, again, once you know what part of the sky to look in, it should be relatively easy to pick it up, assuming that you've got a clear enough horizon in your location to, uh, to see it. And this is a close-up view of the moons of Saturn. And this image is equivalent to what you would hopefully see if you were to use a, a large uh, telescope. This is actually a C14 uh, 
visualization using something like a six or an eight mil eyepiece. So probably having a magnification of something like 300 times. So again, quite high magnification, maybe difficult to get a clear image or a clear view because it's going to be quite low in the sky and a lot of atmospheric turbulence is going to be uh, caused with its position. So showing some of the uh, larger moons of Saturn. I think realistically, if you were to take an image, uh, you might be able to pick up Titan um, with a reasonable uh, exposure. But the other moons are, uh, relatively speaking, quite faint, and therefore they're going to be difficult to pick up without the planet itself just being uh, a blown out blob on your on your image. Uh, but a challenge again to try and photograph the larger moons of, uh, of Saturn. But, so, um, what else can we see in the sky in uh, in the summer months? Uh, well, there are one main meteor shower, which we uh, historically as a society have uh, attended up at the observatory and had a public uh, event. Obviously, that's still to be confirmed whether that's going to happen this year, subject to, to guidelines in the committee's opinion. Uh, however, so that event is the Paris meteor shower, and that occurs uh, in late July through August. Um, but the best viewing is going to be on the evening of the 12th of August this year um, through into the morning of the 13th. Um, and it's going to be from dusk on the 12th, which is going to be somewhere around 10, 10.30 p.m. Um, the moon is going to be uh, at an excellent phase of this, this year. So it's going to be just before a new moon. So there's going to be, the moon's not going to be up. Uh, during the night, so we're going to get a nice, hopefully a nice dark sky uh, to observe the Paris meteor shower. And that's going to be on the evening of the 12th of August into the 13th of August. It's perhaps the the best meteor shower of the year, uh, one of the highest uh, chances of seeing a large number of meteors. Again, nice to observe it uh, with the naked eye uh, from a nice dark site. Get yourself a, a comfy chair that you can recline, uh, position it. Uh, in the sky, looking at the sky, and just sit back and, and watch for meteors. Likewise, an excellent opportunity to to get a camera on a tripod with a nice wide lens, and maybe take some thirty second exposures, depending on how bright the sky is in your location, and you should be able to pick up uh, quite a few meteor trails as the meteors uh, come in throughout the night. Uh, so, so, by far the best meteor shower of the year. There is another meteor shower uh, at the end of July, which is a southern delta act grid. Uh, however, this meteor shower is significantly less intense than the Persids. Uh, however, this year, again, the moon is in a relatively favorable place. The moon, the sky will be dark for most of the night. And due to the position of the Earth relative to the uh, approach through the meteor uh, cloud, we will actually be facing directly into the meteors uh, as, as we pass along um, the plane of the ecliptic and therefore the chances of seeing some meteors is, is relatively high. Um, though the, the average number of meteors that you're going to see uh, during any fixed period is going to be significantly less than the Persids uh, in early August. <clears throat> Obviously with the, with the bright nights, there are uh, bright objects are nice things to see. Uh, they are towards the beginning of July uh, through the middle of July. There's predicted to be a large number of International Space Station transits uh, across our area in South, South Yorkshire. Uh, there are significantly larger number than, than the list put on the screen. However, I've just filtered out the moment the dates where the altitude of the uh, observation is above 45 degrees. So there's the easiest chance of seeing it. Now, this data is, I suppose you could say, provisional at the moment. It's based on the current orbital position of the International Space Station. And obviously, the space station adjusts its position any time up until this point. Then these orbits and these transits may change. All this information can be obtained from the website Heavens Above. All you need to do is put in your location and the website will automatically predict what uh, what ISS transits you will be able to see. It'll tell you uh, how bright it's going to be. 
where it's going to appear in the sky, where it's going to be the highest and brightest, and where it's going to fade from. <clears throat> Likewise, the heavens above has an app for your smartphone. And if you have the GPS turned on, then it will plot uh, the transit across the sky live in your current position. Uh, and it's very easy, therefore, to hopefully look at the sky, pick out some key indicators of where the transit is going to be and uh, make the observation. So <clears throat> please take this information as um, provisional. And if you're interested in observing the International Space Station, Wait till our July, either look at the website or download the app and uh, check out what the latest predictions are going to be. But plenty of chances to observe the International Space Station transits in July. Other things we can see, uh, and this is effectively now, um, the moon at its current time, and as, as of yesterday, I believe, is currently at the perigee position in its orbit. Also, the orbit of the moon is elliptical and the moon gets closer and further away uh, from the Earth as it travels around us. And the distance varies from 356,000 kilometers uh, to 410,000 kilometers throughout the orbit. And at the current time, it's going to be closest. And that's about a 14% difference in. Uh, a mean distance from the Earth to the Moon. So, and that results in a about a 10% change in the diameter of the Moon uh, as measured across the widest point, uh, as seen by us. And that closest approach, also this at this time of the year, coincides with the full Moon. And as a result of that, we get what's called Super Moon. So a full Moon when the Moon is at its closest position at perigee to us. And that occurred, actually occurred last night. Um, if you observe the moon tonight, um, then it's probably going to be somewhere around 93, 94% full. Uh, we missed the uh, 100%, which was in the evening of the 26th and the 25th. But the moon will be slightly bigger, and it, it often does actually appear much brighter uh, to us. But uh, obviously, if you, uh, if you take a picture of the moon with the same lens in the same position throughout the... Uh, its orbit around the Earth, then you will potentially be able to pick up the dis difference in size. And it's, it's about 10% of the diameter as illustrated in this image on the screen. So one of the things that we can do when we, if we want to photograph the moon is actually to try and pull out some color in the moon. The moon, obviously, when we take a photograph normally appears to be relatively monochrome. It's a black and gray and white and occasionally pick up the odd little bit of brownie color on, on the surface. Uh, however, there are techniques uh, which are possible to be used where you can actually extract significant color from the uh, an image of the moon and as a result show up the different terrains on the moon, different elements that are on the surface, different compositions of the rock, um, different reflectivity of the, of the surface of the moon. And these are some examples of what's possible to be produced uh, by taking an image, a color image of the moon. Um, all you need to do so, really, is a DSLR camera, um, always to be set in, in shooting in something called RAW mode, as opposed to the normal uh, JPEG mode you might use for your holiday snaps. Um, this is a more, um, as I said, raw image of the raw collection of the data that comes off this, the sensor rather than it being processed before it's stored on the on the memory card. Um, you don't need to take a lot of images. One image, uh, well exposed, will be sufficient to take this uh, this picture. Um, and the, I've put a link in the description here, at the, in the slide at the bottom of, of the technique to be used. I won't go through the whole technique. I think it's it can be self-explanatory. But if you search. Google or another search engine and, and type imaging the moon in color, then there's lots of tutorials on how to uh, how to perform this photographic technique. But all you need really is a say, DSLR camera and a reasonable telephoto lens on a tripod. And ultimately, just one image, one good raw image will be enough to produce, hopefully, um, a nice color picture of the moon yourself. Uh, so it takes you an example of some of the steps. Uh, and this is the sort of result that you could potentially obtain. Also, the moon is 
up 50% of the time during the night um, throughout its cycle. And therefore, there's lots of opportunity to take pictures of the moon at different phases um, and create dramatic examples of images such as this. Some interesting events during the summer that we can observe. I've talked about that. Um, there are a number of uh, international space stations, solar transits predicted at the moment. Again, this is provisional based on predicted uh, orbits of the ISS, but this time we're talking about early to mid June, and that's only about three weeks away, two to three weeks away. So um, this is sort of obviously the image shown is actually a, a lunar transit, but a solar transit should could potentially produce a similar sort of image. There will be four uh, ISS transits uh, within a distance of 15 kilometers of Swinton during this time. So um, the website I've used to find this information is called Transit Finder. It's an excellent website, provides lots of information. You all need to put in his location that you are at uh, and the distance you're willing to travel to see one of these events and the software will spit out all the possible uh, times when either a lunar transit or a solar transit will occur. Uh, so there are four, four solar transits during this time between the 19th and 13th of uh, June and they all occur between about 1.30 p.m. and 4 p.m. So the sun will be relatively high in the sky during that time. Uh, obviously these are talking about solar uh, events so if you're going to consider trying to photograph this event, I must stress you should only ever look at the sun, uh, either with your eye or with a camera. When the, your eyepiece or your camera is attached to a hydrogen alpha solar telescope, or you have purchased and manufactured a suitable solar filter using materials such as um, barter, astro solar film, or there are other types of film or glass style solar filters available from various telescope retailers um, do not try to use any other type of material to create a filter and um, the sun is many thousands tens of thousands of times brighter than any other object and should only ever use a proper solar filter to look at the sun um, in order to take the sort of uh, record the sort of event you really need some form of high speed uh, camera such as the sort of uh, astro webcams that many people have they're not that expensive 100 to 200 pounds uh, and then you need to take a large number of images in a short period of time. These events typically last, in terms of the sun, it lasts for around 0.6 seconds. The, the ISS will actually transit across the centre of the sun. Also, if it's slightly off to the side, if your position is not buying on the optimum path, then you will get a slightly shorter transit and therefore a slightly uh, less time for the transit to occur. When it occurs across the moon, it typically takes around 0.9 seconds, but for the sun, about 0.6 seconds for the total transit. So if you're taking 50 images per second, then you might get 30 images at best during that period of time where the ISS should be in front of the sun. Most importantly though, if you are going to try and photograph this event, I think it's very difficult to see it visually. I don't think the eye is really sensitive enough to pick up the a space station in front of the sun or the moon within such a short time frame then you need an, an accurate clock such as uh, you can use your smartphone and log on to various websites that will give you the time but i'd always allow an, at least 10 or 20 seconds either side of the predicted time uh, and again check your predicted time as close to the on the day as close as to possible as the actual event in order to ensure that you don't miss it because it will as they say it will be gone in the blink of an eye so uh, some interesting events to observe, obviously during the day, so you don't need to be up at night. If you've got a chance to uh, have some free time during the day, then this is a good event to try and, to try and observe. Um, I apologize that I've missed off the slide. There is an annual, an annual, an annual solar eclipse uh, due to occur uh, in the UK um, in the next couple of months. Uh, the sun will only be uh, covered up for 20, about 24% in our, in our location. It occurs on the 10th of June. Um, 
and the sun, the moon will pass in front of the sun uh, and obscure about 25 to 30 percent of the, of the sun. Uh, it will probably be quite difficult to uh, notice this event, assuming it's clear, um, because the relative brightness of the sun as observed by our eyes is not really going to diminish very much during the during the event. If, however, you have, again, a telescope or a pair of binoculars fitted with the appropriate solar filters, then you'll be able to point at the sun and observe the moon passing in front of the sun um, during the, the annual eclipse. Um, so if you want to know more about that, again, if you search on the internet for annual solar eclipse UK 2021, then all the information will uh, be available to you at uh, what times and uh, what you should hopefully be able to see. So, as Steve mentioned earlier, uh, I quite like uh, looking at globular clusters. Uh, and being that we are approaching uh, the summer where the observing time is relatively short throughout the night and the sky doesn't get quite as dark as perhaps it, it could in the winter, then a list of brighter objects to observe is always uh, something of interest. Uh, I do quite like imaging and looking at trying to look for uh, gaseous deep sky objects, nebula. However, uh, during the summer time, the amount of observing time is a lot shorter and therefore uh, I feel that these sort of objects, clusters are perhaps uh, one of the interesting things to observe. You don't need to get as much time um, and they're easier to find as well. So, so this is a, a map of the sky. Uh, showing this shows all the Messier objects in the sky, and they are all coded by different symbols for the different types of objects. Uh, this, the area of the sky that's going to be most uh, easily observable for us throughout the winter months are approximately the right hand third of the of the image that you see. So the left hand third of the image that you see on the screen. So you'll see in, right in the the middle of the height of the, of the uh, diagram to the board to the left, there is a yellow circle with a cross through it with number five next to it. That's Messier 5. And most of the objects to the left of that uh, are either globular clusters or open clusters, globular clusters being the ones with the crosses through them and open clusters being those with uh, open yellow circles. Now, a lot of the objects in the bottom half of the screen are going to be difficult to observe because they're going to be too low in the sky, even during the uh, you know, towards the end of June. That's still going to be quite low in the sky. So we're realistically going to look at uh, objects which are in the left third and the top half of the, uh, of the image that you see on the screen. It's in the constellation of Serpens or Fuchsius, uh, and, and, and the little ones around there. And as you can see, the majority of those objects are star clusters. There are some nebulous objects and some planetary nebula, but most of them are star clusters. Uh, these are a list of some of the main uh, objects that we're going to have a quick look at. Um, the most, most of them are on uh, in the Messier catalog. Obviously, Messier cataloged around the brightest hundred objects in the sky, obviously, it was later added to by others. But for himself, the catalog around the hundred brightest objects is the Messier catalog, and they are bright objects, and therefore they are uh, easier to observe, especially during the, the the shorter, brighter skies that we get during the summer. So, if, you, if you're not up on globular clusters, what are globular clusters? So, so the left hand diagram shows a uh, position of 116 globular clusters that are within uh, 50,000 light years of the sun. Now these, what that really means is these are clusters of stars, tightly packed clusters of stars that are typically orbiting the Milky Way. Some of them are quite small, some of them are quite large, and some people would say perhaps they are nearly uh, like micro galaxies um, orbiting our own galaxy. Also, we have the large and small Magellanic clouds, which are um, much uh, more 
much larger, but much more diffuse uh, collections of stars that are not that are associated with and do follow our own Milky Way galaxy, but they're not um, truly within the, the plane of the Milky Way. And likewise, globular clusters are not in the plane of the Milky Way, they, they surround the Milky Way uh, galaxy. And as I say, there's a large number of them. And they are uh, very old objects. These stars typically formed between one and two billion, two and a half billion years after the formation of the universe. So our sun is a, a third generation star. It's about three to four billion years old. Um, and it's been made of the debris of, of other stars that have existed before it. And it's uh, material that's come back together to form and ignite to form a new star. Globular clusters are you know, two or three times older than our star. Um, and they exist uh, around the Milky Way. Uh, so Messier catalogued them because they can appear in the sky to be relatively bright, uh, but slightly diffuse and fuzzy, especially with the poorer quality optics that were available two or three hundred years ago. These objects appeared potentially to be comets. Obviously, when they're observed over a period of time, their position relative to the background stars doesn't change. And therefore, Messier was able to catalogue them as his catalogue of non-comets, which is ultimately why he created his catalogue in the first place. He wanted to make a list of objects that appeared to look like comets, but weren't comets. So he could discount them as he, as he hunted the sky for comets. He knew if he saw a fuzzy object, he could look in his catalogue and say, no, I know what that is. Uh, I've seen that already. It's not a comet and, and discount his observations. Um, so the, the stars in, in globular clusters are, say, are very old, they tend to be um, relatively poor in some of the heavy elements, so they're predominantly hydrogen and helium stars, and they're very long-lived. I mean, these stars have been, have been burning for a period now of just 11, 12 billion years, uh, much, much longer than our, our own sun. Um, and they will continue to burn probably much longer after our own sun is dead. So, what what of these globular clusters can we can we see in the sky? So, this is these the images I'm showing on screen. They're not they're not my images. They are, but they are all images taken with amateur type equipment. Uh, so, this is uh, Messier number five. It's in the constellation of Serpents. Um, and it's again a relatively large object. It has a um, diameter of around 22 arc minutes, um, so it's quite large, a bit smaller than the, the full moon. So the full moon LA would have a, when it's its smallest, would have a diameter of about 29 to 30 arc minutes. So this object's about 60% of the diameter of, of the moon. So rel a relatively large object in the sky, and as such. Majority of these objects are easily observable if you've got a pair of 10 by 50 binoculars or larger, up, obviously through a small, up to a, a medium sized telescope. Um, obviously, the larger your telescope that you have, the more resolution you'll be able to obtain, and therefore, the uh, more you'll be able to determine the structure of the cluster. Not all these clusters appear the same, some are, appear to be much more dense so they have more of a, a bright core and they um become more diffuse gradually and some have a are much more of a general fuzzy blob um also picking out individual stars can be difficult unless you've got a very high power magnification or in this case uh, using some form of imaging equipment so um the actual brightness of the main stars itself are not particularly bright the um most of the stars in this cluster are about magnitude 10, but the sum of the brightness of all the stars put together means that the object appears to be significantly brighter. Um, there are variable stars, and what I particularly like about uh, globular clusters is, is imaging them, because by imaging them and processing the image, um, you're able to extract the significant difference in uh, color of the stars in the cluster. So you can see here, uh, this image has been processed, uh, hopefully to a, 
a relatively accurate color and we've got a huge selection of star types and star uh, brightnesses and colors in the in the cluster orange stars blue stars white stars um, so very uh, eclectic mix of, of stars and uh, very interesting to to observe so the next cluster is perhaps the most famous globular cluster. This is Messier 13, often known as the uh, the Great Globular Cluster in, in Hercules, because it's placed in the uh, constellation of Hercules. Uh, best time to observe this is, is effectively now, through the next month or so. Um, it's you know best visible around midnight. It's quite high in the sky. It's about 70 degrees uh, elevation in the sky. So um, quite high up, free from atmospheric, the sort of atmospheric turbulence that we mentioned when we were talking about Jupiter and Saturn being low in the sky. Um, it's much brighter than uh, M5. It has a brightness of, mm -hmm. an overall brightness of 5.8. So uh, it's brighter than some of the other stars in the sky. Uh, and again, best easily observable with binoculars or a uh, telescope. Um, if you're new to observing binoculars or you haven't got a telescope with the go-to function, then these are excellent objects to practice your uh, star hopping skills with. So by getting a star chart, um, lots of star charts feel available online, uh, find the position of the, of the cluster, find and then using your instrument to find some of the brighter stars near it, and then you should be able to jump from star to star to star and hopefully uh, land on this object relatively easily. It's quite, see, they are quite bright and they should be relatively easy to pick out. They, if you've got a smaller instrument, they tend to appear, as I say, a bit like a comet, a fuzzy, sort of a fuzzy blob with a, with a brightish, brightish center, because it depends on the, um, the cluster itself. Everyone's slightly different. Uh, this is uh, Messier 10. This is in the constellation of Fuchsius. Uh, so this cluster is best observed in, in May, uh, sorry, June and July time. Um, again, they're all quite large. This is about um, two and a half arc, two and a half, three arc minutes across, so a bit smaller than um, some of the other clusters. Um, and as you can see on the screen, it's a bit uh, appears to be smaller. But uh, again, a beautiful collection of of, of different shapes of uh, arrangements of stars and also the colors uh, of the stars in the cluster. This is Messier 12, also in Aphusius. So the constellation of Aphusius has got quite a few um, uh, globular clusters in it. Um, so this, this one is, uh, Again, relatively near, uh, it's one of the bright stars in the Fuchsius, Lambda Fuchsius. Um, so it's, it should be easy to, to find if you need to. Um, use star hopping techniques. Also, you can use a go-to telescope if you've got such equipment uh, without a problem. Uh, this is Messier 14. So obviously, these, these numbers, uh, Messier catalog numbers, are some uh, quite low numbers. So they were some of the brightest and most comet-like objects in the sky, and therefore they were entered into Messier's catalogue, the Alice, and hence they have, most of them have some of the, the low numbers, typically under 20, the brightest uh, objects. Um, so I'll jump to a few other ones. Is uh, The last one, uh, these, these are really in the order I would observe them throughout the year, roughly. So these are these are objects for now in June. Uh, they'll also be available, observable later in the year, but they will uh, not be at the the optimum viewing times. Uh, so this is Messier 92. This is also in Hercules, a bit like, like Messier 13. Um, and we this is reckoned this is one of the oldest globular clusters uh, surrounding uh, the Milky Way galaxy. Um, so move on. Uh, I'm fine. Oh, sorry. Uh, and finally, for this period of time, this is the open cluster. Uh, this is called the Coma Star Cluster. Uh, it's in the constellation of uh, Coma, Bren Coma Berensis. This is uh, best observed around now in the sky. Um, there are a number of 
of catalogs of open clusters. Um, not that many open clusters are cataloged in the Messier catalog because they're not dense enough to appear uh, diffuse and nebulous and comet-like in the sky. Um, there are two other catalogs of open clusters which are uh, I would recommend. Uh, one is the Malotti catalog, and this this object is catalogued as number one hundred and eleven in that catalog. Or is also the Colinder catalog. These are both catalogs of open clusters. Um, objects such as obviously the Pleiades are open clusters, uh, Beehive cluster, etc. Uh, but these are two excellent catalogs of open clusters. Um, now, with obviously with open, unlike globular clusters, where the stars are all um, positioned relatively close to each other in space. Co uh, open clusters can often actually be quite diffuse uh, in terms of, although the stars are, themselves are, are separated relative to our line of sight, they can also be at significantly different distances from us. It's just that they appear to be a collection of bright stars uh, in, our, in the sky within our field of view. Um, they're, but they're not necessarily actually uh, always associated with each other in physical space. Uh, so this cluster contains around 40 bright stars um, between magnitude 5 and 10. So uh, of the magnitude 5 stars are generally observable with good skies with the naked eye. And when we get down to magnitude 10, we're going to need a small to medium sized telescope to, to really pick those out. So. The amount of stars you see within the cluster is really going to depend on the type of instrument which you uh, use to observe them. The brightest stars in the cluster tend to make out a distinctive uh, V shape, um, and that is relative to our position in the sky. Um, so it's, it's yeah, one of the sort of best open clusters to observe at this time of, of the year. Uh, as we move through into July time, uh, a couple of other globular clusters become available. This is Messier 55. This is in the constellation of Sagittarius. Um, and this has been known since, about, since the 1750s. Uh, best observed with, again, 50 mil plus binoculars. Um, but if you want to resolve, start resolving individual stars in this cluster, you really need sort of six inch, eight inch size telescope uh, or obviously higher depending on um, the magnification that you can use with your eyepieces. Um, it's about 17,500 light years from the sun, and it contains the equivalent of about 270 solar masses worth of stars, so a huge number of actual stars in, in the cluster itself. Um, it's reckoned that if you can get a good close observation uh, with a big telescope, you might be able to pick out uh, 40 or 50 individual bright stars in the center of the cluster. Again, a huge selection of color in the stars that can be observed. Uh, also, as we get higher up the Messier list, the size of the globular clusters tend to diminish slightly. This is Messier 71, so one of the later ones. It's also, this is in the constellation of Sagitta. Um, slightly, although it's slightly closer to us, it's, this one's 12,000 light years from the Earth. Because it contains a significantly smaller number of stars, typically around 53 solar masses compared to 200 plus solar masses for uh, M55, the cluster itself is, is, is much smaller in the sky. And it's uh, also much less dense, uh, densely packed. So you can see it is starting to, or you can almost start to see through the cluster, whereas previously with the other clusters, the density of the core is such that it becomes pretty much opaque to the background behind it. Um, this is uh, open, the open cluster in the constellation of Seraphins. It's sometimes known as Graf's cluster. Uh, it's not actually catalogued, as far as I can tell, in the uh, Malotti or Colander catalog, and it has designation IC4756. Um, it can also be sometimes known as NGC 6633 um, or the Secret Garden Cluster for some reason. Um, again, nicely, the open clusters tend to be a larger diameter in the sky and therefore observation with a small telescope, low power magnification, 
or a pair of binoculars is is optimal. The cluster contains around 80 stars of between 7 and 12 magnitude, and they're quite evenly spaced uh, across, across the cluster. There's no dis definitive uh, shape to any of the bright stars in this cluster that I can find has been noted. Um, but an interesting selection of different star colours um, in the cluster. So uh, one perhaps a bit more challenging to find because there's going to be no great concentration of, of stars. So uh, for the unguided observer, then um, a bit of a, ch a, bit of a, a star hopping challenge in the sky. Uh, next objects, is, these are we're really into August now, the optimum time to look at some of these, these objects. Uh, this is Messier 15 in the constellation of Pegasus. Um, it's about further, quite far away from the, the, the Earth. It's 36, 34,000 light years away. Um, it contains around uh, 100,000 stars, so quite a large cluster. Uh, many of these clusters also contain large numbers of variable stars, sometimes pulsars, uh, neutron stars uh, as well. And it's also been observed in M15 that there are at least one planetary nebula uh, in the cluster. Now, realistically, to observe those sort of objects um, within the cluster, you're going to need a very large telescope, probably something outside of what is a, uh, obtainable with uh, amateur type budgets. So um, for us, it's really about uh, being able to observe the cluster, appreciate the shape um, and how the stars appear. And if you're into imaging, you can take a a nice image. The to image a, a globular cluster um, with a, an, an SLR type camera, you're probably going to need somewhere around an hour's worth of, um, 45 minutes to an hour's worth of, uh, of good exposures. Uh, don't need to be that long, also the stars are quite bright and it can easily be possible to overexpose the image. So uh, probably something like one minute exposures uh, over a period of say 45 minutes to an hour should be sufficient uh, data to collect to actually produce a nice image of of a globular cluster. I will say if you go to nebulous type objects, you're talking about taking three, five minute exposures over a period of uh, a whole night or, or many nights in order to create a, a good quality image. So these are, if you're into, new into imaging or you're uh, wanting to resharpen your skills, globular clusters are excellent objects to, uh, to practice on and also practice your um, post-processing skills on as well. This is a uh, Messier 2. It's in the constellation of Aquarius. Um, also one of the, the earliest objects found by, by Messier. Um, there are no overall any bright stars in the constellation, but the constellation, uh, sorry, the cluster itself is very large. Uh, again, easily observable with binoculars. Um, so um, nice, cheap observing, uh, observing targets for, for this time of year. Um, this is the Beehive Cluster, uh, Messier uh, 44. It's also in uh, the other catalogs as well. Uh, it's in the constellation of Cancer. And it's uh, physically one of the nearest open clusters to the Earth. Um, it's only at a distance of about 600 light years away. Um, so this is within, unlike the globular clusters which surround the Milky Way, these, these star clusters sit within, within the Milky Way itself. Um, I believe this was actually the cluster that was used um, by uh, Eddington to try and prove the uh, um, Einstein's theory of relativity um, when during a solar eclipse in 19, I think it was 17 or 1918, um, they measured the position of the stars uh, relative to the sun uh, before and after the eclipse, during the eclipse, sorry. and. Uh, supposedly showed that the sun had sufficient gravity to uh, to bend light, though there's debates about whether the sensitivity of the equipment was such to, to actually be able to prove that or not. Um, but it's one of the, say, one of the, the brightest clusters um, in the sky, uh, easily observable. Um, the next one, this is uh, NGC 188. It's also in uh, the Caldwell catalog. It's Caldwell number one. It's in the constellation of Cepheus. Uh, it was discovered quite late by 
John Herschel in, in the 1820s. Um, and uh, it's actually drifting apart uh, the cluster itself as, as it, as it uh, it interacts with the Milky Way. So uh, over the next million or so years, the shape of the cluster will actually change. Obviously, we won't be around to actually observe it. Um, it's about 5,000 light years from, from the Earth. And as you can see, it's a sort of relatively open, but slightly denser collection of the background stars. Um, probably quite uh, relatively difficult to find. Um, and these last couple are, uh, again, other open clusters uh, in the constellation of uh, Cepheus. So Cepheus is a, a good constellation to look in for these sort of objects. Um, this is NGC 7142. Um, it's a relatively diffuse uh, open cluster. Uh, and finally, we have NGC 7510, uh, again, also in the constellation of Cepheus. Uh, near the border of Cassiopeia, um, and it's uh, there's a bit of nebulosity and uh, uh, interstellar gas and dust uh, in this area. Um, and if you've got long enough exposure, it's possible to pick to pick that up. You can perhaps just see a little bit at the uh, on the bottom of the image. It depends on the screen and your lighting in, that you've got uh, around. So. Um, I suppose to summarise, I'd say that uh, there's plenty to look at in the next couple of months. We've got a wide selection of uh, planetary and uh, solar, sorry, um, solar system type objects. Uh, the moon is an excellent target um, to look at if you've not got a huge amount of observing time. If you want to be a bit more dedicated and uh, spend a bit more time uh, with either binoculars or a telescope, then I would highly recommend uh, searching at some of these uh, Gobra clusters, but I think perhaps more interestingly, uh, some of the open clusters, because it's nice to be able to spend some time looking down the eyepiece, uh, take some time to really study these stars and see what shapes you can make out, make out hopefully some different colours of the stars, brighter stars in the the cluster, and uh, just take take a bit of time to uh, to observe. The, the more time you put in, the more you'll see. Uh, and the more you appreciate the uh, the interesting structures that are that are there. So hope that's uh, given you a list of, a bit of a flavour and uh, a list of objects to look at over the next couple of months. And uh, that's me done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. And we're all back. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, I always do enjoy your briefing sessions. Uh, it just reminds me of the uh, the huge wide range of objects we've got to look at. Um, I also like globular clusters. Uh, they're one of the few. They're one of the few objects that, when you're actually um, processing them, actually have a sense of depth of view, so that you feel mm. that you're actually looking at a three D object rather than just disc or a plane. A really nice uh, object. Thank you very much, Andrew, for the talk. Uh, so we're looking for questions. Uh, as usual, electronic hands, uh, if you've got them, otherwise wave at me. And uh, has anybody got a question? No. Uh, Michael. Yeah, uh, just just a note about um, IC4665. Um, it is actually a completely separate object from NGC 6633. Um, IC4665. Is, is an Ophiuchus. It's it's right above Beta Ophiuchus. You, you can just about see it with the naked eye. Where, whereas um, NGC 6633 is quite quite a bit further east. So they are two two, two completely different objects. Okay, must have got my data across. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Andrew, do you, just talking about globular clusters while you were talking. Uh, is there any evidence of a black hole at the centre of these globular clusters, or are they not massive enough? I don't. I haven't come across any. Uh, a few pulsars and other things, but not uh, not black holes. I don't think there's enough uh, mass there, really. Mass there. Okay. So, uh, Peter Lloyd. 
that you were mentioning globular clusters and, and, and Andrew, that was something in your early part of your talk that intrigued me. You showed the distribution of globular clusters around the galactic plane and the vast majority of them seem to be south of the plane, which sort of intrigued me. As, um, does that mean they're all very really far south in the sky as well? Yeah, that, that graph, Peter, is actually showing the uh, RA and declination position of the... Uh, of the uh, objects, but yes, they are. Oh. Uh, oh, that wasn't the galactic plane. No. Oh, right. There are. Um, I think it's the universe. It's uh, McMaster University on their website. There are. They plotted the position of them in in several different ways. Um, so, it's, if you want to look at that, if you go to their, um, if you type McMaster University uh, globular clusters, and they say they presented the data in two or three different ways using different reference. Points, right. Oh, thank you. Okay, Peter, thank you for that. Uh, I'm still looking for questions. Uh, Phil Muffet. Drew, that map you had of the measure, measure objects uh, that were really good. I've seen a few, but that were really, really easy to read. You ought to have one of them up in the observatory on notice board. Uh, just give people an idea to look for something different when you go observing, because I think some of us tend to look at the same things time after time, and you forget what's out there. Just just, just a point. But a really good talk. Thank you, Phil. <laughs> Tony Morris. So, just uh, as Andrew said, looking for the, the retrograde motion of the planets and imaging over many nights, uh, with your stacking software, uh, you can't use average stacking. You need to use maximum stacking because it takes the maximum value at the registered point. Okay. Yeah, because otherwise you'd average the planet out to nothing. Yes. Yeah, so you, you set your software to maximum. All right. So that's how you can produce star trails and stuff like that, just by altering your, your, your stacking software, how it does it. Just a point, if anybody tries it and wonders where the planets have gone. <laughs> easily done easily done thank you for that uh, Andrew Devey come in the Spanish yeah. judge <laughs> in Espanol <laughs> just a point when uh, Andrew mentioned about you're trying to do the moons of say Saturn the planet blows out but what a lot of the images do is They'll use images of the planet itself and then use uh, parts of the overexposed images to put the moons on so they are quite complex composites what are actually presented. Yeah, I think it just depends on, on how many moons you can pick up and how close they are to the actual planet at the time and the balance of the exposure when you're trying to get the moons so that you don't get so much uh, sort of bleeding into of the image that you sort of just create a, an oversized blob of a planet that kind of masks everything else. The, the most straightforward way to deal with that problem is to process uh, the image twice, once for the moons and once for the, the planet, and then combine them. Yeah, it's just when you image the moons, you often need a, a longer exposure, and it's yeah. it, often difficult to... Um, you, you could, if you obviously if you saturate the sensor on the uh, the camera, then you, there's not no data to process for the planet. It's just it's just white. But if it if it if it sort of bleeds over, then you've uh, you've kind of lost anything that's yeah. too close to the uh, planet. So I think I've seen one of Roy's our images of I think it was um, moons of Uranus, and it was it was diff you know difficult to pick out the moons because they were so close to the planet that mm -hmm. you could just about get it, but um, there was so much, uh, so much bleed from the the pilot that it kind of it created a bit of a hail that used to almost swamp the moons. Yeah. Thanks, Tony Morris. Just just to, to pick up on what Andrew was saying, that so imaging about imaging uh, the uh, the transits. Uh, obviously, uh, if you've got a, a DSLR or any other camera that you've got connected to a telescope, uh, if you set it in AVI mode. Uh, you you get you know video mode. You, sh you should get you know twenty five or thirty frames a second. 
So that's very dependent on how you set your gain up or your ISO, but it's a lot faster than trying to use, you know, the, a traditional shutter or, on a DSLR. So, you, you know, most modern DSLRs in movie mode will produce 25, 30 frames a second, depending on what you've got it set at. So you will get multiple images. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Ian Hargreaves from, uh, welcome Ian. I Thank think you're you. a first time visitor from uh, Milton Keynes. No, not that one. The other one, Mid Kent Astronomical Oh, Mid Kent, System. sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I just I just presume you're from, I, my apologies. Yes, it's, there are uh, two. There are two. And we are the one in Kent. Uh, uh, do, do you know, we're always getting mixed up with, uh, is it Macclesfield in Sutton? Or Mansfield and St Sutton. Yeah, but not the Manchester Sun and the Air Society. No, not those. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ian, your question, please. Yes, I, well, not so much a question. Well, partly a question. Whenever I image globular clusters, I never get the stars nice and tight. I can never seem to get them tight enough to be, um, you know, uh, aesthetically pleasing to look at. And some of those images there were, they were obviously very good images. And I wondered if anybody else had some tips on what to do about that. Ian, what, are you, what equipment are you using to start off with? Uh, right, I'm using, <laughs> I'm using a Nexstar 11 inch on a, um, a fork mount, but with an active optics unit on the back end. So it should take out any other little glitches from the fork mount but um I, I get pretty good images of um more diffuse objects but not not globular clusters i've never taken a pic an image of a globular cluster that i was happy with and what camera are you using uh asi 294 mc okay gentlemen I think it's... Do you use a bat enough mass for focusing? I do, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're brilliant, aren't they? Absolutely mm. brilliant. I think but... it's, from my experience, it's, it's timing the... getting your exposure uh, right. That you, um, you, you know, you, at the end it's better to slightly underexpose and then, and then bring right. the image out rather than try to get the optimum exposure because um, there's always a chance that you... You get that little bit of a bleed around the stars, and they start to become a bit diffuse. Right. Okay. So, thanks. Uh, keep yeah. the exposure. Keep the exposure down. There's, if you've got a camera like that, a cooled camera, there's always enough data there to uh, to stretch it out without having to uh, to try and perfectly expose, you know, optimum expose the stars uh, on the actual image yourself. Right. Okay. Keep, keep the exposure yeah. down to say sixty seconds, something like that, rather than you know a couple of minutes. Yeah, I'd, I'd what, go I'd, further than that, Andrew. Sorry, I'd, I'd go faster than that. But yeah, maybe thirty seconds. So time. if if I image from home, uh, if I image at shorter durations, my full width half maximum, the size of the stellar image, is quite a bit smaller than if I image for longer. So as, mm. as as long as you've got enough to get some color data out try shorter exposures and stacking more of them okay thank you yeah i mean uh, what i normally do is when i take an object uh, uh, an image i normally look at the histogram and just make sure that i'm not you know getting too far over to the right hand side of the histogram um so i was thinking that by doing that the 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 actual individual pixels wouldn't be over, you know, wouldn't be saturating and therefore wouldn't be bleeding, but maybe, maybe it's, not. It's more, I think it's more down to, it's it's down to the stability of your mount. The longer you're exposing for the more inaccuracies you're, you're pulling into the system. Hmm. Yeah. So it's, Ian, you've probably heard of lucky imaging. Mm, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So mm. th those guys and gals that are using those techniques, you know, they're, they're using that sometimes less than 10 second exposures and taking thousands of them say 
you know, some of their images are really tight. Yeah. And it's uh, obviously if, if you take 500 exposures at 10 seconds, you can afford to th throw 200 away that aren't good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 sorry, carry on. So, Ian, I, I've not tried photographing globular clusters before, but I have done some observing with binoculars. I've got some 8x30 uh, bird spotting binoculars. I take them all because they're light and, light and easy to carry. And in my back garden in Swinton, I cannot resolve any stars at all in globular clusters. I went to Kilda Forest about five years ago on holiday. And I thought, well, before I go to bed, I'll just go and have a look, see what I can see. I look at M13 and I could not believe how many stars I could see in the cluster. Mm. Mm. In my back garden, I can't see any individual stars. No. Dark location, better seeing conditions. I can see individual stars by the hundred. Yeah. So irrespective of the photographic techniques, I think your seeing conditions are critical as well. Mm. Yeah. Just an well, observation. I, I, certainly, I, 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 you know, M13 and uh, the, the bigger globulars. Yeah, if if I sit there and, and somebody said about this, observing them for a long time through the eyepiece, and I sit, sometimes sit there for 20, 30 minutes, and all these stars pop out, you know, you, you start seeing more and more discrete stars. But when I, when I try imaging it, it as I say, I, I just don't see that at all. But uh, So Ian, so. Do, you, do you image after you've observed? Or say, if you're going out for an evening, you say you're going out for visual or you're going out for imaging or do you do a mix? I, I do a block because, you know, it just takes too long to take all the imaging gear off the the um, next star. Because, uh, I, I, as I say, I use an active, optic, active optics unit. I'm using an off-axis guider. I'm doing, and it just takes so long to get it all right. Uh, and I've got an observatory in the back garden. So I just go, I leave it on the, on the telescope, all set up with all the imaging gear. And then I'll take, normally take the camera in, but leave everything else set up. Um, and then, <clears throat> so I tend to go out and do, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks of imaging. And then I'll swap it over and I'll do, quite a bit of uh, eyeballing because I, I love that and one of the best things that I like about the um, next star is when it's zooming in onto a target and it starts slowly sweeping across the sky to reach the target and just looking through the eyepiece at the time when it's doing that is it's just fantastic yeah so how often how often do you refocus in uh right with um i have to be honest probably twice a night at the most so it could be a temperature thing i don't know um i don't i don't swing about the sky though mm -hmm. um on the celestron there's a precise go-to feature which will find you a mag 2 star or, yeah. or brighter <coughs> within a couple of degrees of your target that you've tight you know you've entered on the handset which means that you can do all your collimation all your and i do i collimate every time uh, i do the collimation i then do the um focus with the bartonoff mask and then i move to the object which as i say is only normally a couple of degrees away so it shouldn't be mirror flop or anything like that um but uh yeah I, I, i've never cracked it <laughs> Very frustrating. Can I can I chip in here? I, I, I I'm I'm puzzled by your, all your difficulties here, and I don't claim to be a particularly good at deep space objects. And I just had a quick look at my picture of M14, and the, the, the lovely stars, crystal sharp, and they were done with none of the, the sophistication you're using. I wouldn't have been using guiding or anything like that. It was on a uh, a 10 inch LX200 with a focal reducer to give me 400 millimeters focal length. It was done with a, a rather old Starlight Express camera, which has got fairly big pixels. And I took 10 60 second exposures and stacked them. Uh, a little bit of fiddling with um, wavelengths and registering that sort of thing. But 
Mm. Maybe. Are you possibly trying to get too much magnification? Well, I'm stuck with, you know, with that telescope. It's got a 2.8, yeah, 2,800, 2.8 metre focal length. Well, that's so, quite long. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, well, that's why I use an AO unit on the back of it. Yeah. But it works. It works lovely for most deep sky objects. You know, diff, diffuse ones like you know faint fuzzies and things like that, because uh, it really brings them up a lot bigger. I, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, can you put a focal reducer on it? I can. Um, the mi the minimum one is a f six point uh, f point. Uh, what is it? 0.6 or something. Yeah, f.65, I think, 0.63, the, the Celestron one. So and that so that will bring it down a bit, but any any um, smaller than that, and you don't get a big enough exit pupil to fill the um, uh, detector in the in the camera. So oh, it's a, it's a big detector as well, is it? No, it's a re the, yeah, it's not that huge. It's not 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 as big as uh, some, but it, uh, it does start to you get vignetting, yet fairly serious vi vignetting oh, with a right. yeah, it's because it goes down to a three point three, doesn't it, or point three three or whatever they call it. It's three point three. Yeah, it's three point three, isn't it? Yeah. I, I was going to say my, mine is a point three three. That takes me down from two thousand four hundred to six hundred. Sorry, six hundred millimeter focal length of it. Three. No. Ian, what oh, was your, hey. do you are you using PhD tool for guiding? Oh, don't get me on that one. Oh, <laughs> I cannot get it to talk to my AO unit. I'm having problems. I I, I just yesterday I emailed um, PhD two forum, posted on the PhD two forum, and some guys come back to me who's using a fairly similar setup. And he's saying he's got no no problems with his setup. It just connects because I can't connect. You know where you go into PhD to connect all the equipment. If yeah. I press the connect button, it just doesn't connect. Um, but the guy said to me, he said, "Well, you've got a checkbox there that says um, wait for cooling or something." And he said, "Why would you have that on a lodestar?" Because it's not a cool camera. Now I've I've never noticed that there. I've never ticked it, so uh, I, I'm going to have a play with that. At the moment, the scope is indoors because I've been doing a major overhaul to the mechanics. So uh, I've got it sitting, much to my wife's annoyance, it's sitting on the kitchen worktop, looking out the window at the moment. Uh -huh. <laughs> because I, 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 that's quite handy for the coffee machine. So when you get a bit frustrated with it not working reach for the cup of coffee <laughs> okay thank you ian yeah well, thank, uh, you. Well, thank you thank you for we, inviting me we look forward to uh, seeing some of your results uh graham lever has been waiting patiently <laughs> <laughs> and waving at me every so often graham can you unmute yourself please yeah uh, been graham yeah thank you um it was just a quick remark on taking um, AVIs with DSLR that Tony M was talking about. Yeah. What software do you use to actually make your AVI stat? I mean, like um, a normal webcam or imaging source thing, I use the usual, reg well, not Registrax, Autostackert and, and yeah. the rest of it. But I haven't found a software that will take the size of the AVI out of my uh, DSLR right. when you're talking about APS size. Yeah, so you're talking of something over four gig. What, for the total AVI? Yeah. Oh yeah, because I'm up to, when I'm taking say two minutes AVI with my imaging source, I'm getting two gigabyte files just with that, with the either the 31 or, well, the, the monochrome third of an inch one. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, so I use I use Pix Insight for all my processing. Uh, but I, I use my main machine's got Linux on it, and there are quite a few programs where you can disassemble AVIs into individual frames. Yeah. So. Yeah. Sounds but, if it's 
auto, auto stack it should be able to do something. Uh, well, um, maybe I've got a pen, it's a Pentax camera, so maybe their style of AVI is different mm. to, uh, say, a Canon or, um, you know, another DSLR. Right, so, so, so AVI is a fairly common so-called standard. So one, once you've got into the AVI format, provided you've got the correct codec, in the decode software, you should be able to read it with with most programs like VLC. You might be able to disassemble it in VLC. And VLC is multi-platform and free. Okay, I'll have to search around. I've seen it occasionally once ago. It's never been something for me to yeah, further program, forward with. There's a, a program called uh, Bit back to AVI, I think, and I think it does it the other way around as well. So it'll it'll throw out a load of uh, eight bit bitmaps, and then you can, uh, you know, manipulate them in other software. Sounds if I'm going to have to get a bit more technical as well. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, there are quite a few programs out there, but you, you just have to get the search terms right in your favorite search engine to find them. Okay, ladies and gents. Thank you. Uh, all right, Graham, uh, come back to us uh, with any issues. Uh, John Leach. Hi, uh, Graham, um, you say you've got a Pentax camera. Um, you may be able to alter the, the, the format of the AVI file within the camera settings. All oh, right, I've not noticed that on any menu. I'll, I'll have a look. I think, I think you'll, you'll find you, you might be able to do that. Okay, I'll have a look. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gents. Uh, just, I, yeah, oh, Ian. Don't, hold on, hold on. There's two. <laughs> so, so Graham, Graham, I've just had a quick Google, uh, and there's uh, a program called AVI Stack that's come up quite high up the list. So it looks like it's it's fairly old. It was last updated in 2014, but it's free. So that's AVI Stack. Okay, I'll, I'll have a look for that then. said, you might be able to, you know, tweak the parameters of your AVI. Yeah. On, on okay. save. Thanks for your help. What I want to do is just pull this part of the meeting to close by uh, saying thank you to Andrew. Uh, lots to uh, look at there, Andrew. And uh, can we give, ev can everybody give Andrew a big next Brunswick International Society? Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew.